When digging into the behind-the-scenes stories of Nintendo games, you will often find that the company has a habit of completely shifting directions when it suits them. Their notoriously high standards sometimes lead them to changing course in search of a better gaming experience. This video is devoted to those left turns, and the original visions abandoned by Nintendo projects along the way. There have been many examples of this over the years, but I'll be focusing on just a handful of these what-if scenarios, including some that have never previously been revealed. Despite the relatively small scale of the project, Animal Crossing's first mobile game could not avoid some fairly severe development issues. Initially announced in 2016, the company originally planned to bring Animal Crossing to mobile platforms before the end of that year. However, by September 2016 it was pushed back, and players were told to expect it by the end of March 2017. When the end of March rolled around, the game was still nowhere to be seen. No official description of it was given, nor any footage shown. Instead, it was unceremoniously delayed again during an investor's briefing. It wasn't until seven months later that the project finally stepped out of the shadows in October 2017, revealed as Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. This free-to-play slice of Animal Crossing attempted to tap into many of the series' traditional elements, like trading furniture and completing tasks for villagers. Although, had the game been allowed to release on its original schedule, fans would have seen a different take on the franchise. Throughout 2016, Nintendo had been working on a mobile title known internally as Animal Crossing Town Planner. Sources close to the project described it as a game in which players would build and manage their own towns from scratch. This included deciding where buildings and public work projects would go, along with some light elements of economy management. Players could visit the towns of friends, comparing and trading items with them over the internet. After being under development for the best part of a year, the game was seen as falling short of the quality standards set by Nintendo. It was deemed too bare-bones and simplistic, sending its developers back to the drawing board. Almost all of the work done on this first iteration was tossed out, and the project would begin anew, eventually evolving into Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. Originating as a recurring character in 3D Mario games, Captain Toad eventually received his own spin-off in the form of Captain Toad's Treasure Tracker. It tasked players with guiding its titular hero, an adventurous Toad in Safari garb, to collect the treasure hidden in each world. Weighed down by his backpack, Captain Toad is unable to jump and instead relies on items, power-ups and moving platforms. These stages first made an appearance in Super Mario 3D World, dubbed The Adventures of Captain Toad. Back before even that, however, they were originally envisioned as being their own separate game, a game that had nothing to do with either Captain Toad or Mario. Towards the start of the Wii U's life cycle, Shinya Hirotaki, a planner at Nintendo, had devised an idea for a new game where players would navigate diorama-like environments. They would move the camera to rotate the diorama world suspended in the air, revealing clues and secret areas by observing it from different angles. Hirotaki had been mostly involved with the Mario series at this point in his career, but reasoned that a Mario character might not be a suitable protagonist for this kind of game. This was because he intended for the hero in his game to be unable to jump. Looking to Nintendo's other franchises, Link from The Legend of Zelda was soon thought to be a good fit for the project, given that he traditionally did not jump in his games. Hirotaki led a small team of developers at Nintendo to create a tech demo for the project, and soon found himself demoing it to a board of Nintendo executives. According to a Game Inform interview on this subject from 2014, there was a misunderstanding regarding the concept between the developers and Nintendo designer Shigeru Miyamoto. We must have done too good of a job with our demo, said Hirotaki, because during our presentation, Mr. Miyamoto asked us how we were planning on bringing these dioramas into production. He thought we were pitching him an actual physical product design. Despite some apparent enthusiasm on the part of Miyamoto, the idea of using the Legend of Zelda property was shot down, and the project did not move forward. Instead, at a later date, Miyamoto suggested implementing the concept into the next Mario game in development, Super Mario 3D World. As discussions continued, Hirotaki recalled an Explorer Toad character from the Mario Galaxy games, and reasoned that the backpack he wore would weigh him down, making him unable to jump. With this realisation, the protagonist of these side levels, and ultimately a new game was found. 
Project Hummer was the codename of a first-party Nintendo brawler being developed at US Game Studio Nintendo Software Technology. This infamous case study in game development gone awry was first revealed at E3 2006, as Nintendo laid out their lineup for the launch of the Wii. At this point, Project Hammer was presented as a game making full use of the Wii's motion controls. Official PR images showed players swinging the controller to mimic flailing a giant hammer. This may have led some to believe that the Wii Remote had always been at the heart of the game's premise, but this is not so. In fact, the original concept behind this project had nothing to do with the Wii. The initial proposal for the game that would evolve into Project Hammer dates back to late 2003. Upon completing 1080 Avalanche for the GameCube, a team at Nintendo Software Tech was tasked with planning out their next big game. It didn't take long before a rough direction was settled on, they would be tackling the hack and slash genre. This was decided after the observation had been made by the development team that Nintendo lacked such a game in their first party portfolio. Third party support for this genre on Nintendo systems was sparse as well. While games like Dynasty Warriors were making their way to PlayStation and Xbox around this time, Nintendo's struggling GameCube was going without. Looking to Dynasty Warriors in particular, NST hoped to craft an original first party hack and slash exclusively for the GameCube using a similar style of gameplay. The developers even took it as far as referring to it as a Dynasty Warriors for the West in meetings. Upon gaining Nintendo's approval, full development was underway in 2004. The game was expected to release sometime in the twilight years of the GameCube due to the console's lackluster sales performance and the expectation that Nintendo would move on to its success sensor before long. Although, what exactly this new machine would be was a closely guarded secret at Nintendo's Japanese headquarters. Nintendo Software Technology, despite being a key studio of theirs at the time, had zero insight into what this system would be like. Former developers from this hack and slash project say at the time they expected their new game could come to this new platform. They imagined that if Nintendo planned to move existing GameCube projects to this new console, porting their game would be a fairly straightforward task. They had no idea, however, that this new hardware, codenamed Revolution, would be radically different from its predecessor. It sported a completely different controller interface, featuring an infrared pointer and motion sensors. To make matters worse, the developers only learned of this when Nintendo President Satoru Iwata took to the stage at Tokyo Game Show 2005 and revealed it to the press. Audiences around the world reacted with surprise, but few were shocked as NST developers who now face the prospect of having to entirely rework their game with no prior warning. Over the following year, it changed, adopting a focus on the Wii's motion controls and becoming Project Hammer. The game's original concept was iterated upon and was never glimpsed by the public. Between interviews and a comprehensive GDC presentation, the history of Splatoon is fairly well documented. Its creators have divulged many of the ideas left on the cutting room floor on their way to making an original shooter IP about transforming squids. Before the project had found this identity, the developers had considered various other possibilities for their main characters, including anthropomorphic rabbits. One of the more notable concepts tried out involved the Mario series. At an early stage in development, Nintendo explored the idea of setting it in the Mario universe and including characters like Yoshi. Both Mario himself and various colours of Yoshi were tested as playable characters, wielding the same style of ink guns later featured in the final game. It employed the same basic turf war style of gameplay where the team who have covered the most ground with ink wins. The Mario characters concept was ultimately short-lived. The team arrived at the conclusion that creating their own characters from scratch would allow them to have something more fit for purpose. In using the Mario IP, they observed a disconnect between the gameplay and its characters. There was no easily ascertainable reason for why they would be spreading ink or competing in a game of this style. By using squids as they later supposed, it would make more sense to players why these characters would be spraying ink and swimming through it. Regardless, Nintendo continued to flirt with the idea of using Mario assets in Splatoon after the conception of the Inklings. They created a test level based upon the first level from Super Mario 3D World, Super Bell Hill. 
The next project on our list underwent not just one, but two significant transformations on its long journey to being finished. Tokyo Mirage Session Sharp FE was an Atlas-developed RPG for the Wii U. The game was a crossover between the Shin Megami Tensei and Fire Emblem franchises that was originally announced under the simple name of Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem. This collaboration was the brainchild of Nintendo producer Kaori Ando, who revealed in an interview with Nintendo Dream that it was not in fact the first crossover title she had attempted. Ando, who was working primarily on Pokemon spin-offs around this time, realised the potential of mixing the rules of the Pokemon RPGs with those of the Fire Emblem series. This led her to submitting a proposal for a Nintendo DS crossover game combining the two in mid-2010. These plans were quickly shot down by Nintendo executives because they were already planning a Pokemon tactical RPG named Pokemon Conquest, also for the DS. By coincidence, the pitch for this project had only recently been approved, Ando's proposal was deemed too similar to it. Still intrigued by the prospect of a Fire Emblem spin-off, she soon devised another pitch just days later, now proposing a crossover with the Shin Megami Tensei franchise. Nintendo greenlit the idea, and the company tabled a meeting with Atlas, the company behind Shin Megami Tensei. At an early stage in development, the concept at the heart of Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem was far removed from the game it would eventually grow into. When it was first announced in January 2013, it was being envisioned as a grid-based strategy RPG in the vein of past Fire Emblem titles. However, as full-scale production was set to ramp up, it was decided that Atlas would take up the reins and assume full development duties themselves. Previously, they had been shared jointly between them and Nintendo during pre-production. It was for this reason that much of what had already been mapped out was scrapped, since Nintendo's intelligence systems, the developers behind Fire Emblem, would not be handling the project, the two parties agreed that Atlas should make the game in a style that would play upon their strengths. Therefore, its direction shifted away from a Fire Emblem-esque experience and more towards a traditional RPG. The reworking pushed the project's schedule back on multiple occasions, before it was eventually finished at the end of 2015. Aura Aura Climber is a platformer that was developed by Nintendo Software Technology for the DSiWare platform. The game follows a fallen star named Aura Aura trying to make his way back into the sky. Players zip between grapple points to gradually progress upwards, gaining power-ups and items along the way. Produced by Kensuke Tanabe of Metroid Prime fame, Aura Aura was the first new IP that NST had made in years after a number of non-starters. Although, had Nintendo gone with another plan they had considered for the game, it would have been linked to an existing franchise. According to Nintendo's sources, a group of senior staff overseeing the game in Japan were unsure about its viability as an original IP. Their suggestion, made midway into development, was to replace Aura Aura with Yoshi and turn it into a new spin-off game of some kind. Yoshi's tongue would have been used to propel him towards different platforms in a game using essentially the same mechanics. The concept was received unenthusiastically among staff making the game, say former developers, who had previously enjoyed the creative freedom the project had brought. After some back and forth, the idea of transforming it into a Yoshi game was brought to an end by Nintendo president Satoru Iwata himself. Wanting to respect the developer's wishes and have the project finished on time, Aura Aura Climber was allowed to stay true to its original vision. It was released in February 2010 to positive reviews. For more content like this, please don't forget to subscribe. You can support my research on Patreon like these kind people did. I've been Liam and I hope you'll join me for another Game History Secrets.